Hi, uh, Panos, should I just jump straight into it? Please, by all means, you're the chair, oh. you have the power. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. So welcome everyone to the final panel of today's uh, sessions. I, I'm very happy to be chairing this panel. I'm of course very sad not to be meeting you all in person in The Hague, uh, but it is what it is, of course, at this point in time. Um, so this panel deals with uh, customer international law in context, looking at three different courts or even case studies, I might say, um, and how different courts really interpret custom and how far do they go, what are the gaps, and is there really interpretative engagement or are we still talking more about identification? First, we have Neha Jain, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, from the EUI. Then we will have Paula Baldini from the Grotius Center, and then Tamas Molnar from the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. Hi, and thank you all for joining. I was planning on switching the order around to have uh, Paula start, but I think at the end of the day, we'll keep to this order as it was set out in the program. Uh, so we will, I, I haven't received a paper or an abstract uh, for Neha's presentation, but I'm very, very much looking forward to that. And of course, Paulus and Thomas's as well. So how we'll proceed, I will first introduce the first speaker, then we'll hear the presentation, and I will briefly give a introduction of the second speaker and at the end I will say very few words about the overall topic and the papers and presentations we hear today. Uh, I will have fairly passive role I think. I am a little bit sleep deprived, COVID children and so on. So I will invite the audience to be active, ask questions and I will also try to be quite strict on the 20 minute timeline. So without further ado, I will introduce Neha. So Neha is professor of public international law and co-director of the Academy of European Law in Florence at the EUI. She is on special leave from the University of Minnesota. She has published extensively, including a monograph with Hart and in the Agile in the European Journal, Harvard International Law Journal, and so on. Uh, she has also worked at the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Criminal Law and in the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study and the Danish Research Foundation Center, as well as the Lauterpacht Center. Uh, so you can check her full bio on the program, very impressive. So, and I, I can't see Neha actually here. There, there you are. Okay. So I, I will just give the floor to Neha and uh, she will be talking about managerial custom and how custom is asserted, avoided and used as a backstop in the international criminal courts, criminal tribunals. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Noura, um, and thanks, Panos, and the entire Tricky team for your heroic efforts in bringing us all together, uh, notwithstanding all the pandemic pivots. Um, I actually was in The Hague several years back, but it's been raining steadily in Florence for the past two days, so I feel I've been magically transported to The Hague, um, even though I'm still currently ostensibly sitting in Italy. Um, so I wanted to, um, I initially actually thought of labeling my presentation customary confusion, uh, since as many, many of you have hinted in the previous two panels, uh, the jurisprudence of the International Criminal Courts on, on the identification and interpretation of custom seems unbelievably chaotic. Uh, but the more I dug into the jurisprudence, uh, the more I realized that actually a method to the madness, or rather several methods to the madness. And the method, um, I argue, is influenced by managerialism. So, and by managerialism, I mean faith in the proposition that issues of conflict and violence and serious harm can and should be construed as problems of international criminal law. And that the more international criminal law rules one has, the more likely it is that the international community will actually be able to resolve these issues. And so how does this faith then play out um, in the actual identification and interpretation of custom 
And I argue that it does so through three devices. The first is treating custom as backstop. The second is custom as, uh, as the expression of foundational values of the international community. Um, and there are some parallels here with what uh, the previous panel especially addressed. And then finally, custom is a tool for conflict avoidance. Um, and so let me first begin with, with the first device, which is possibly the easiest and, and possibly the most ubiquitous device, even not in international criminal law, which is the idea of customer's backstop. Um, and here it's uh, for international criminal lawyers, especially um, it's quite an obvious proposition that uh, before the coming into force of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the treaty architecture of international criminal law was, was relatively sparse. So you have judges at the ad hoc tribunals uh, in the 90s, at the ICTY and the ICTR, who are being called upon to bridge not just the impunity gap between Nuremberg um, and the setting up of these tribunals, but also equally the international legal gap between these two junctures um, in the life of international criminal law. And so the task of these judges then becomes not merely to revive international criminal law, because in most cases there is nothing to resuscitate, uh, but to actually create it from whole cloth. And for this, they look not to the classical source of public international law for gap filling, which is traditionally associated with general principles of international law, but to customary international law. And the question is, why do they do that? Um, and the reason lies partly in the mixed identity of international criminal law, which is as much a branch of criminal law as it is a subfield of public international law. And as such, international criminal courts are expected to comply with the principle of legality, uh, which takes the form of a series of rules, uh, but the most important of which for our purposes here is the prohibition against retroactive criminalization and the requirement of notice of fair warning, um, which in domestic criminal law systems would counsel against the judicial creation of offenses. And so you have judges at these international criminal tribunals who are in a, who are in a really unenviable position. They're working within the limits of a skeletal international criminal law treaty architecture, that often has no specific answers to questions um, on the specific elements of an international offense or questions such as a particular defense, um, such as duress or necessity, um, whether it would be available for international crimes. And at the same time, they can't possibly say that, well, in a significant percentage of cases, international criminal law simply doesn't have an answer. And so our hands are tied, sorry, we have to dec declare a non-liquid. And so the solution they hit upon is a creative resort to custom as the most authoritative non-treaty source of international law that they feel can still meet the demands of the principle of legality. And we see an explicit attempt to try and thread this needle in the report um, of the Secretary General establishing the Tribunal for Yugoslavia, which emphasizes that the tribunal only has the competence to try accused persons for violations of customary norms of IHL that unreservedly provide for individual criminal responsibility. And so the report thus um, draws a direct link between adherence to the principle of legality and the identification and interpretation of appropriate customary international law norms, thus creating the fiction that the tribunal is not in fact in the business of creating any new law, but rather it would simply be identifying and applying existing international law norms. The fiction, though, is quite difficult to sustain in practice because of one crucial fact, which is that there is no state practice, or at least not the sort of uniform and consistent state practice that we would need in order to satisfy the traditional two element test um, that's typically required for custom. And so this explains why the tribunals end up resorting to what uh, various people have called um, the modern approach to uh, custom identification and interpretation where in short, you first look to open your uris, or in some cases, only to open your uris, and only then try and seek to bolster your conclusions um, through supporting state practice. Um, the weight, in other words, that's accorded to the two elements uh, becomes quite different um, from what we would normally and conventionally expect. But ironically, um, and in the context of international criminal law, the search for the kinds of evidence that would serve to demonstrate state practice or opinion uris lead judges back to treaties. So it's not uncommon, for example, um, at the Tribunal for Yugoslavia, in cases such as Tadic, to declare that the very adoption of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which is not yet enforced, by the way, by a large number of states, by itself constitutes an authoritative expression of their legal, of their legal position. 
um, and especially listening to Stephen in the previous panel, it would be, um, I'd be curious to hear his opinions on the time element here and what it's doing here, given the fact that the Rome Statute had been signed, um, but certainly hadn't come into force. And that's then being used um, by the Tribunal for Yugoslavia to demonstrate the ostensible existence of opinion juris. And this brings me to, to the second point, um, which is that as much as this interpretive posture has been criticized in some quarters for either double counting the same source, um, say as evidence in both state practice and opinion juris, or for um, dubious expansions of the types of sources that can serve as evidence of either or both of these elements, um, it nonetheless speaks to the tribunal's attempts to ground their customary findings um, in a system that accords privacy to state consent. The situations where the tribunal's custom finding exercise has taken a true credibility hit are where in identifying or interpreting the particular customary rule, the tribunal entirely forgoes any reference to either state practice or to opinion juris. And one example of this is an early ruling by, by the pretrial chamber of the International Criminal Court um, on the immunity of sitting heads of state, where the chamber postulates the emergence of a customary international law rule um, that there is an exception to the, to the immunity of sitting heads of state in cases of international crimes. But rather than citing any state practice or opinion juris to this effect, the pretrial chamber instead references um, the Nuremberg principles, uh, which are fairly abstract. But then it cites the ruling of the Special Court for Sierra Leone um, in the Taylor case um, and the Tribunal for Yugoslavia in the Milosevic case. So in other words, the customary basis is deduced from the case law of other international criminal courts. And since the last panel was, was so rich in metaphors, um, let me use another one here, which is the, the mythological idea of, um, of the world turtle that supports a flat earth um, on its back. And the idea is that this turtle, you know, so what does this turtle rest on? The turtle rests ostensibly on the back of an even larger turtle, which itself is part of a column of increasingly large turtles that continue indefinitely. Uh, this, uh, this is the, the, sort of the metaphor of infinite regress. And in our case, so the flat earth seems to be a rule of customary international law that seems to rest on the back of a ruling by an international criminal tribunal, which themselves rest on rulings by other international criminal tribunals um, all the way down. So, so the turtle, you know, it turtles all the way down um, without any state practice or opinion juris. Uh, but the decision, this is not an anomaly though, um, and this is the important part. Um, so in 2019, um, the ICC Appeals Chamber, for example, um, uh, again holds that under customary international law, heads of state are not immune from arrest by other states when executing a warrant that an international court has issued. But again, rather than showing that this position enjoys um, some sort of widespread support um, in practice and in opinion juris, the Appeals Chamber simply declares that it has no need to carry this justificatory burden. Um, but rather, and, and this I quote in the words of the chamber, the onus is on those who claim that there is such immunity in relation to international courts to establish sufficient state practice and an opinion of juris. So it's a reversal of burden. There is a presumption here, uh, which is based on the jurisprudence of other international criminal courts, and whoever wants to challenge it, it it's up to them to then come up with the state practice and opinion of juris, which given that there is no state practice and opinion of juris to begin with, is an impossible burden to discharge. Another example of this near complete departure from reliance on state conduct um, um, are situations where the customary international rule is simply asserted rather than demonstrated. Um, and this of course is not unique to the international criminal tribunals um, as we've heard several times um, during, the, uh, during the previous panels. Um, and again, Stefan Talman's article has been, has been referenced here in the context of the ICJ, where he argues that uh, rather than induction or deduction, in the large majority of cases, the ICJ simply asserts um, the law that sees, sees fit, um, supposedly pulling customary international rabbits out of its hat uh, without any support whatsoever for the assertion. But I use assertion by the international criminal tribunals in a slightly different sense from Taman, and in a sense that's closer to his category, his special category of deductive customary law where customary international law rules are derived from the unwritten constitutional values of the international community without any need for these rules to then be corroborated by state practice and opinion juris. 
Um, the international criminal tribunals have been guilty of this very assertive sense of deductive customary law um, in a few instances. And perhaps uh, the most egregious of, of these is the infamous Kopreskic case. Um, here, um, the trial chamber of, of the Tribunal for Yugoslavia was faced with um, determining individual criminal responsibility for reprisals against civilians. And in order to do this, it turned to the status of the prohibition under customary international law, whereupon it was compelled to admit, um, and again I quote, there does not seem to have emerged recently a body of state practice consistently supporting the proposition that one of the elements of custom, namely uses, has taken shape. This is, however, an area where opinion euris may play a much greater role than uses, as a result of the Marxist clause. This clause clearly shows that principles of international humanitarian law may emerge through a customary process under the pressure of the demands of humanity or the dictates of public conscience even where state practice is scant or inconsistent. Note that this is not merely a case where the tribunal determines that there is no consistent or reliable practice, but even the so-called opinion juris can be directly derived from the Martin's Clause, the exact legal status of which is itself subject to much debate among scholars. For some scholars, the clause is simply an interpretive principle and nothing more. Others say they rank it amongst um, sources of public international law, uh, which translates positive law um, into um, principles of uh, translates into positive law, principles of humanity and the dictates of public conscience. Others still claim that it is a general principle of international law. Um, but whichever view you take of, of the Martin's clause, the ostensible customary rule is being derived directly from some sort of principle of the international community. Um, arguably a moral principle and not a legal principle, uh, rather than via state conduct. And for scholars who consider the Martin's Clause a general principle of public international law, um, in effect, the tribunal is deriving um, a principle of customary international law from a general principle of law, which itself, again, um, gives rise to some doubts about the place of the division between and the hierarchy of sources, um, at least the way it's conceived in classical public international law. And finally, I want to reflect on, on the third aspect of customs managerialism um, that might be contributing to, um, to the tribunal's interpretive posture on custom. And this is one of conflict avoidance. Um, and this is the intriguing thesis um, that's put forward by Alexandre Gollin in his uh, analysis of the modern approach to custom identification. And to appreciate the argument though, it's important to take a step back and recognize uh, that the way in which the, um, the regime of international criminal law has evolved is, um, is a sui generis amalgam of the criminal law, the law of armed conflict, and human rights law. And this, this mix of elements is responsible for what um, Daryl Robinson has called the identity crisis of international criminal law, where liberal criminal law principles, such as the principle of legality, often come into conflict with more human rights inspired reasoning, um, such as victim centered um, teleological treaty interpretation, for example. And so Garland's argument um, is uh, on the interpretation of custom by the ICTs fits into this crisis narrative, even though that's not the framing he adopts. Um, for him, the international criminal tribunals have been faced with a situation where there's a conceptual clash between the norms of international humanitarian law and those of human rights law. And in the normal course of things, if international humanitarian law would be considered the lex specialis, then in the case of a conflict, it would have primacy over human rights law. In a case like Kopreskic, the ICTY finds itself navigating the situation in deciding whether for purposes of individual criminal responsibility, the law of belligerent reprisals would apply in non-international armed conflicts just the same as it would in the case of international armed conflicts. Or in other words, whether, whether, whether the victims of non-international armed conflicts have the right to have their perpetrator punished just as they would in international armed conflicts. And so faced with this gap between the more developed human rights law norm on the right to life and the more rudimentary state of customary international human right, international humanitarian law, in dealing with non-international armed conflicts, the chamber, according to Gallon, decides to use the customary international law norm to update the international humanitarian law norm. So in other words, in order to avoid norm conflict and ostensible norm conflict, 
between the more liberal, the more expansive human rights law norm and the more narrow and the more conservative um, law of armed conflict position, the, cham the chamber simply invents a customary international law, law, um, law norm rule in order to converge, adopt a convergence between these two bodies. And even though Gallen focuses on a particular case at a specific tribunal, which is this Kapraskic case at the ICTY, his analysis actually has implications for the role and the function and the interpretive posture on custom far beyond the ICTY or international criminal law for that matter. And it goes to the heart of international law as a coherent legal order and what role the sources of law can play in that endeavor. And so the question for us, and I will conclude with this, is whether custom should be construed as a tool for harmonization amongst different subfields of international law that may have different solutions to the very same problem and that will be at different stages of development. And if so, what implications does this have for international criminal tribunals, but also for international courts more generally, who are actually tasked with finding and interpreting custom? So thank you for your attention and I really look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Neha. Very interesting and I have to say thought provoking, but I think I'll save my questions and comments, which I wasn't supposed to have many, but hmm, as it happens, I have a few to the end. I will um, now introduce Paula and give the floor to her afterwards. So Paula Baldini, she's a PhD candidate at the Grotius Center, as well as the managing editor of the Leiden Journal. She's also a qualified attorney registered at the Brazilian Bar. Um, and today, Paula will be uh, presenting her paper that deals with the interpretation of direction and control in, in investor state arbitration. And look, she looks at the, how the, this context shapes interpretation of general international customary rules, especially in relation to Article 8 of the Articles on State Responsibility for International Wrongful Conduct. So the floor is yours, Paolo. Thank you, Nora. And thank you, everybody from the Tricky Law. And also, especially Marina, for moving everything online so fast and helping us so much with this. So thank you. Uh, as Nora has already said, I'm going to be discussing the interpretation of Article 8, more specifically the interpretation of the standard of control in the context of investment arbitration. Investment arbitration is a system that has been existing for around 60 years, the way that it is today, investor state arbitration. And my research revolves around state-owned enterprises, specifically both as claimants and as defendants in, uh, and as part of defendants in the, in the context of investment state arbitration. And therefore, I fell upon, I stumbled upon the issue of Article 8 and how the conduct of state-owned enterprise could be attributed to states in the context of these cases. I found, interestingly, that there are two different approaches that tribunals have taken towards this. One of them is very predictably following the general standard of in general international law. So the traditional effective control over the specific actions. And if there is the effective control over specific actions, those actions will be attributed to the state and therefore the state will be held responsible for that. This has been the interpretation in about half of the cases that I found, not that many because there aren't many cases discussing this, but easily around five, all of them specifically making reference to Nicaragua, to uh, the genocide case, both in the, by the ICJ. However, there's also another very interesting approach that tribunals have been taking, and this is what I would like to discuss. This other approach basically assumes that the effective control over actions approach standard and threshold for attributing actions of non-state entities may be too high in the context of investor state arbitration. This was specifically mentioned in the Bahindi versus Pakistan case but also in others, and therefore they decide to adopt a lower threshold. This lower threshold, sometimes they do not explain what it is. They just say that the other one is too high, which is what they said in Binder. But there's another one even lower, and which is for me the most interesting of all, if, where they do attribute the actions of any entity that the, that the, that the state holds, holds shareholding over. 
this was, is what they did in the end in Mafred City. They assumed that since the, the corporation that was being discussed at the case was owned by the state, their actions were automatically attributed to the state. They looked at statute of uh, the sta the statute the 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 corporate documents of the of the of the corporation and they took a look at who had corporate control over it this was also followed in another few cases for example the salini case the rfcc case in, against morocco also hilnan and also karki karadenis versus pakistan and all of these they look at specific documents and the most interesting part for me is that not only they look at those documents, but they don't look for any specific kind of corporate characteristics. They look for majority shareholding or any other kind of power that would give corporate control. And more interesting of all, they also refer to this as effective control. So what we end up having in the in the in the, in these cases is that we have two types of of effective control that are applied in the context of investment arbitration for the purposes of, of attribution. One of them is the traditional that we're used to seeing in international law. The other one is the corporate control that can be through special powers such as golden shares, but also just mere majority shareholding. And this can lead to attribution in these cases. So why does this happen? Which I think is the main point of my research. What shapes and what makes this what makes this into what we see in this odd body of law? I think it's two things. I think that the first point is that we are dealing specifically with state-owned enterprises in the context of investment law, which is a system that was made to depoliticize investment disputes and politicization, politicization specifically in these cases is linked to the presence of states. Uh, so you take the state, so the, so the idea behind it is that you take the state of the, out of the equation as much as possible. You prohibit interstate disputes, you, the same way you also don't have any more, you don't have any more uh, domestic courts that are subject to states dealing with cases. So you take it to an international level and therefore that you associate and you kind of associate the, pres the presence or the link to the state with a politicization. The second, the second point that happens there is that although they do, they do recognize that state-owned enterprises are not necessarily the state, there is an idea and you can see in the way that they refer to it, that there is a belief that they, that they still see it as somewhat affected by state interests. And then you have the famous quote by Adam Brojas, who is the main uh, creator of investment state arbitration the way that we see it today. What Brojas said when discussing the possibility of having a state-owned enterprise as a claimant was that he wouldn't see any problem in it if it elected to assimilate itself as a private enterprise. So he sees that as kind of an exception and the rule being a state-owned enterprise being linked to a state interest and not operating independently. So I see that there is a general overall caution of investment tribunals and those that deal with investment arbitration towards any activities involving state-owned enterprises in general. But just caution is also not enough for you to change how you're interpreting these cases. You also need some legal support and not just a random impression of an arbitrator about an enterprise being more politicized than others. I, I believe that what happens is that they borrowed a different definition in control of control that, there's, that also exists in investment law. If you take a look at exit, uh, at the exit convention article 25.2, what they do say there is that it is possible that the nationality of domestic, a domestic investor based in the host state can be considered a foreign investor if they are controlled by a foreign company. And there they say control again. And how has this kind of control being, being dealt with in practice? In the exact same way that we see in, for example, Mafetzini. You see they interpret control by looking at the corporate characteristics at the company and seeing who is the parent company of that, uh, of that corporation and who is the corporate controller of that corporation. And they use the same way effective control. So I think that we end up here with a scenario one where we have two di completely different types of, of, of effective controls 
one of them focused on specific actions and control over them. The other one, corporate control, doesn't matter what the actions are. It's based on the institutional characteristic of the entity. Uh, but however, they are in the same scenario. And although they are meant for different situations, it's difficult. It's easy to see how um, a lawyer and arbitrator may face these two concepts that are very similar, used in different ways, and see them as interpretative options. And then they, therefore, they look at them and they say, okay, I can apply whichever of these I need for a specific situation. And you end up with situations such as Bindir, where they say that the general international law standard is not adequate for the case that they're dealing at the time and therefore they're going to do it differently. And especially when you're dealing with some with a situation that they consider especially delicate, such as it is the cases of state-owned enterprises, I can see how this may lead to a choice that would be unusual for someone looking from the outside, but for them it makes perfect sense because you have these two seemingly at very very similar options, but that they can be picked by them as they please and as they would see. So I think that my point here is that the way that you have the, the particular shaping of rules within a specific system, the characteristics that you have, the way that it evolves over time, and the fact that sometimes you may have specific options that are available to arbitrators can shape how specific rules of international law are interpreted in practice. What you ended up having in, in investment law is although unintentionally, we have today two different complete reveals of the same article of Article 8 into, uh, for the purposes of attribution. And those are because of a specific rule that came out and the way that this the system is shaped towards depolitization. And I'm looking forward to comments. I'm looking forward to um, whatever views you have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paula. And I'm extremely impressed how everybody has so far kept to the time. So we are not at all over time <clears throat> so far. Um, I think this is very interesting to get the views from different contexts on interpretation and how the same, the same rules take different forms depending on the context and on the institution and in this leads me to our final speaker today Thomas Molnar who will be talking about the European Court of Justice or the Court of Justice of the EU and how that body deals with customary international law and interpretation. So Thomas is a legal research officer at the EU agency for fundamental rights in Vienna, as well as a visiting lecturer on international migration law at Corvinus University of Budapest. He has worked previously in various ministries in Hungary dealing with international law and EU law. And his latest monograph out this year is titled The Interplay Between the EU's Return Acquis and International Law. So, I give the floor to Thomas. Many thanks, Madam Chair, Leonora. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first off, uh, uh, um, I would like to express my gratitude uh, uh, for the organizers that uh, I've been included in the program. It's my uh, great honor and privilege to be here with you. And I also acknowledge the challenge that I'm the last speaker of this uh, really rich and long day and your level of energy might have dropped uh, uh, so far. And nevertheless, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do my best. And I, I will also uh, share my screen uh, to uh, present uh, some slides. Uh, let me go back. All right. Can you see it? Uh, it's now on full screen, so you can see the, the landing page. OK, so the title of my presentation is the uh, EU Court of Justice and the Interpretation of Customer International Law, Close Encounters of a, a, a Third uh, Kind. Uh, without further ado, just jumping into the, the, the topic, um, it's a matter of fact that uh, uh, the, the EU and its legal order uh, uh, is, is bound, bound by uh, customer international norms and customer international law is an is, uh, uh, integral part uh, of the uh, EU legal order. And then uh, the EU Court of Justice, CJU, must use customer international law at least as an interpretative uh, uh, tool. Uh, 
still the way the, the EU court interprets uh, custom international norms uh, and its interpretative methods uh, remain understudied in academic legal uh, scholarship. So I thought uh, uh, this can be an interesting exercise to uh, look uh, deeper in, in that. And uh, the EU court, including the advocate generals, generally uh, in that identify uh, rules of customer international law in codification treaties to which the EU is not party, and also uh, on the base of judgments uh, uh, delivered by the ICJ uh, and its uh, predecessor. Um, but is then interpretation needed? So once uh, a CIL norm has been identified, uh, does uh, one also know uh, its content? This is where the needs for interpretation of such in unwritten norms uh, kick in. And this, let's say, paper and the presentation uh, aims at uh, mapping and understanding the ways uh, the EU court interprets uh, rules of customer international law, and also to comprehend uh, what are the the, the, the reasons uh, of its specific engagement and whether we can see unique features uh, if, if there's um, any. Um, just shortly about the role of customer international law in the EU legal order, I will start with that uh, it's arguable that, that the CIA rules play a more important role in the EU legal order than in the domestic legal systems of, of member states, uh, given that the EU is a distinct international legal person couldn't or didn't accede to a great number of international conventions which codify certain areas of international uh, law. So for lack of being bound by codified treaty rules, the EU remains bound by parallel existing uh, customary uh, norms. And um, in its existence of more than 60 years, the, the EU court uh, developed uh, quite a number of, of, or not developed, but rather recognized quite a number of uh, uh, CIA rules as part of the EU legal order, which uh, range from uh, several principles of the law of the treaties, the right to innocent passage, individuals' right to enter their own country, uh, jurisdictional immunity of states, and the list uh, uh, goes on. And in practice, uh, customer international rules uh, are used mostly as interpretative tools uh, when, when the EU court deals with the, the acts of EU institutions. So when interpreting uh, pieces of secondary EU law, but uh, also uh, in theory, uh, CIL can also serve as, as a ground to assess the legality of secondary EU law. And uh, especially uh, when private parties seek to invoke customer norms before the EU court, then uh, questions of direct effects of the given CIL norm um, comes up. Uh, final preliminary remark is that uh, uh, when the EU court interprets uh, CIL norms as being integral part of the EU legal order, uh, then the, the, the rulings are also binding on, on, on member states. Consequently, uh, such interpretation uh, influences their practice and opinion juris. So uh, the CJEU judgments engaging with customer international rules have a multiplying uh, or snowball uh, effect. Um, in, the, in the following, I will bring uh, you four examples for, let's say, case studies uh, to illustrate the EU court's approach to the interpretation of uh, customer international law. The first one uh, is uh, uh, the immunity of states from jurisdiction. So this, this norm will be examined in context uh, before the Luxembourg uh, court. There are two leading cases in this regard. The first is the uh, uh, Mahamdia and the second is Rina case. Uh, the, the core legal issues uh, in Mahamdia revolve around the possibility to, to challenge uh, in view of state immunity uh, before uh, German courts, the dismissal of a, uh, a worker who had been employed as a driver by the embassy of Algeria in Germany. Whereas in, in Rina, uh, the key issue at stake was uh, whether the uh, customer norm of state of unity uh, uh, applies to private bodies that have been delegated uh, uh, the discharge of duties under international law, namely the certification and classification of ships by the sovereign state of Panama. And the outcome of the two um, cases was similar, the relative nature of state immunity. Uh, Sorry, was, Thomas, I uh, think I think your mic might have turned a little bit. Um, could you see, we, we couldn't hear you very well for the past 10 seconds or so. Uh, Okay, um, I try to move closer to the- uh, There we go, yes. 
Yes, I think you are back in the room. Okay, so now it's better and uh, you can hear me loud and clear. Now we can, thank you. All right, thanks, thanks, thanks for um, this. Um, so uh, these two cases, I mean, the outcome was the relative nature of state immunity. And uh, uh, in Mahamdia, the court actually found that the dismissal of this chauffeur by the embassy qualifies as an act jura gestionis, so no immunity applies. And similarly, uh, in Rune in Rina, uh, 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 the, the private actors didn't enjoy uh, immunity from jurisdiction simply because they are delegated by state to perform. Uh, certain obligations, namely the certification and classification of, of uh, uh, ships, even if they act on behalf of a third uh, country. Uh, methodologically speaking, a peculiar division of labor can be seen uh, 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 between the advocate generals and the, and the court. Since the advocate generals carried out the substantive uh, in-depth uh, analysis and, and unfolding the meaning of state immunity and its exceptions, and then the outcome of this legal analysis was essentially taken up by the EU courts uh, uh, by just referring to the key findings of the uh, AJ's uh, uh, opinion. So that was simply asserting uh, the given uh, customary uh, norm. And in terms of, of substance, uh, the interpretative engagement, mainly by the AG, um, consisted of the task of distinguishing between acts performed Jure imperi and jure uh, gestionis. So uh, it was about delimiting the boundaries of possible uh, exceptions, uh, meaning that that acts jure gestionis do not enjoy uh, immunity. Um, at this stage of the interpretation uh, a process, uh, the, the advocate generals uh, uh, had to prove that certain exceptions exist as self-standing mini rules. Uh, and at the same time, still forming part of a larger customary principle as the letters derived or, or, or special rule. And for this exercise, the uh, uh, advocate generals resorted as evidence to a wide range of uh, materials, national legislations, domestic case law, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, conventions, of course, as well as academic uh, scholarship. So the AGs try to, to uh, do their best. And then the uh, EU courts um, just took the, just uh, described uh, uh, taking for granted assessment and relied on, 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 the, qualifi on the qualification uh, provided by the AGs uh, without going into any analysis uh, uh, whatsoever. It was just a simple uh, assertion that doctrine of relative immunity replaced that of absolute uh, immunity uh, in our times. Then the second example concerns uh, the right to self-determination and state's permanent sovereignty uh, over the natural resources, which came up in a series of cases concerning the legality uh, of extending the application of the EU, Morocco, trade and fisheries agreements to the territory of Western Sahara. So they, these are three uh, important cases, the Front Polisario 1, the Western Sahara campaign, and the Front Polisario 2 uh, cases. Uh, as for the permanent sovereignty over uh, natural uh, resources, uh, it was interesting in the very beginning that the Advocate General, uh, although uh, recognized that it has something to do with uh, self-determination, it didn't qualify as the derivative uh, of, of, uh, of uh, state determination, uh, which is by the way the generally accepted position amongst international uh, uh, lawyers. So it somehow anchored it uh, to uh, state determination, but uh, it didn't take a stand. And uh, when it comes to the materials, the AG relied on, on a series of UNG, uh, UN General Assembly resolutions following the, by the way, criticized method applied by the ICJ in the RTC versus Uganda uh, case. And remarkably, um, it has not, he has not regarded uh, this uh, customer norm as implying erga omnes uh, obligations, contrary to uh, several commentators, the position of the African Union, and also to two dissenting judges in uh, the East Timor case before the, the ICJ. And um, 
in, in the subsequent case, I mean, so far that was front police are you won. And then in the Western Sahara case, there was a turn in that. Uh, he changed the characterization as ergo this obligation without really uh, going into the details. Why? And uh, it also, he also engaged in, in the exercise of uh, examining whether uh, this rule has a direct effect uh, within the EU legal order, meaning that private parties can uh, invoke it uh, to invalidate uh, uh, a conflicting, an allegedly conflicting uh, a piece of secondary EU, EU law. And uh, for, for that exercise, he relied on an additional source, which was just the soft law, uh, a, a letter from 2002 of the UN Secretary General for Legal Affairs, which was like an analysis of, of, of this norm. And the conclusion of the AG was that uh, despite some uncertainties about its contours, uh, this principle of permanent sovereign over natural resources is sufficiently clear and precise, which is capable of forming the basis for judicial review of uh, acts of EU institutions. And now uh, the right to self-determination. I will also start with the AG, uh, as opinion, and then we'll turn to how the EU courts dealt with that. Uh, it was interesting to see that first it was conceived as a human right. So that was the, the move um, to uh, squeeze it into the category of fundamental rights as general principles of EU law. And by this transformation, the AG could comfortably resort to the classic interpretation techniques employed for unpacking fundamental rights as general principles of EU law, meaning it could draw inspiration from those human rights treaties on which the member states have collaborated or to which they are signatories. And the AG uh, relied on ICCPR, then the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, the 75 Helsinki Final Act, as well as other instruments and also academic uh, literature alongside uh, the jurisprudence of, of, of the ICJ. Um, then it also he also conceived it as a uh, uh, principle, customary principle of international law with erga omnes uh, uh, character and analyzed whether this customer rule reflects a clear and sufficiently precise and unconditional norm. And for this, for this, uh, uh, he, he uh, relied on the ICJ's advisory opinion in, in the Ball uh, case and a number of international instruments enshrining uh, the right to self-determination. And the outcome of this analysis was that it's unconditional and sufficiently uh, precise. So the, the end results uh, boosted this uh, principle's uh, normativity and, and, and put its judicial enforceability uh, to a, a, a higher level. So it's quite progressive. But on the other hand, the EU courts uh, didn't really engage uh, in the exercise of the complex interpretation of me nor ne neither the, the permanent sovereignty over natural resources nor the right to self-determination. At least there was some engagement with the right to self-determination, but it was mainly identification based on some ICJ case law and, and uh, invoking uh, a couple of uh, UNGA uh, resolutions. But again, uh, um, the court just accepted uh, such legal text and materials as sufficiently illuminating the meaning and, and some aspects of the content of, of the, the given norms, and that was enough for, for, for it. Yet on the front of the legal nature and the possible legal effects of both uh, uh, customer and norms, uh, the, the recognition of their invocability by private parties in court proceedings uh, is, is a move uh, uh, forward. Then, uh, conscious of, of the time, I move on to the third example, which is the obligation not to defeat the object and purpose of the signed treaty, this interim obligation as codified in Article 18 of the Vienna Convention. Uh, when, when the EU court uh, has engaged with this, with this customary norm, the outcome of this uh, exercise was basically the transformation or repackaging of this, or, of, of this norm for the purpose of the EU legal order into a general principle of, of EU law with all the legal ramifications. Uh, it entails uh, uh, the addresses of the norm uh, are changed and include uh, private individuals. The, there are different legal effects uh, and so on. The case at hand is the Opel Austria case, 
where the uh, general court applied this principle of customary norm, the, the interim obligation, but its reasoning and ob the operative part of the ruling was not based on, on, on this uh, uh, international legal rule. I will not dwell uh, uh, into the factual uh, background, uh, suffice to say that uh, private operators invoke the uh, uh, invalidity of an EU uh, regulation on the basis of, of, of this interim obligation. And the general court accepted the applicant's um, arguments that the EU is bound by this customary interim obligation. But then it found uh, that this is the corollary of the EU law principle of, of uh, uh, protection of legitimate expectations. So the court was not convinced whether private parties could rely directly on this customary principle of international law and finally based its ruling, uh, quashing the contest regulation, on the protection of legitimate expectations as a general principle of, of EU law. So it's very interesting, this kind of transformation technique, uh, which also uh, allowed uh, 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 for the EU to assert the autonomy of the EU law and to portray it as an independent legal system that doesn't derive its authority from international law. The fourth example, the last example, concerns the territorial scope uh, of treaties. And as a preliminary remark, uh, the EU court virtually always interprets customary law when resorting to the VCLT rules, given that it was not bound by the Vienna Convention, but only by, by the parallel existing, existing equivalent uh, customary uh, rules of, of treaty law. Uh, and an illustrative example is um, the, the uh, way the EU court interprets uh, this customary rule of territorial scope of treaties as enshrined in Article 29 of the VCLT. This provision looks straightforward, so it doesn't need further clarification, but the complexities of the Front Polisario and the Western Sahara uh, campaign uh, uh, cases led the EU to engage with this rule and to deconstruct its components. And uh, the, the EU court found support in international treaty making uh, practice, pointing out that those treaties which apply beyond the territory of a state use specific terms, like under the jurisdiction of the state or any of the territories for uh, whose international relations it is responsible. And then the court construed its own definition of territorial scope uh, as follows. Uh, the territory is a geographical scope, space, over which the state exercises the fullness of its powers granted, by, granted to sovereign entities to the exclusion of any other territory, such as a territory likely to be under the sole jurisdiction or the sole international responsibility of that state. And some commentators note, citing the travaux of the VCLC, that uh, the, the customer norm, in a sense, is just the fallback clause if a treaty doesn't define the territory application. But the EU courts uh, gave much more significance to this provision, interpreting it to mean that the treaty only applies with respect to the territory over which a state exercises full sovereign powers, unless there's an express provision uh, uh, providing for its application to other territory. So uh, it set out the stricter requirements, uh, stricter requirements, uh, uh, meaning that when a treaty is intended to produce extraterritorial effect, the wording of its territorial scope clause must be formulated in such a way to uh, expressly provide for this effect. Uh, to conclude, uh, the way the EU court and the advocate generals interpret customer international law is largely influenced by the, by the role uh, these norms play uh, in the case uh, uh, at hand. Uh, the two main scenarios is when uh, CIL is an interpretation tool uh, or it's a benchmark of, of validity. And when uh, CIL uh, is used for the consistent interpretation of, of EU law, um, it's not the, the CIL rule which is in the center of attention, but the EU law provision. So uh, there's, there's less room for thorough engagement. And the typical case for that uh, is when the EU court confronts with questions of law of treaties uh, uh, when dealing, for instance, with an EU agreement and then employs the rule book of the VCLT. Uh, 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 and uh, a far-fetched uh, application of, of, of that was uh, what we've seen uh, in, with, the, with the territorial scope uh, uh, interpretation. Then uh, a more central role of, of uh, EU of the interpretation of the of, of the customary norm before the uh, CJEU is, in theory, when it's used as a standard of revision of secondary uh, EU law, 
uh, uh, to challenge the validity of, of, of a legal act adopted by the EU institutions. And this scenario uh, forces the EU court to interpret the invoked uh, customer rule, at least to, to determine whether it has uh, direct effects. We've seen that uh, uh, in Flon Polisario and the Western Sahara campaign cases, mm -hmm. and the Advocate General did so, but then uh, despite uh, his efforts and lengthy analysis, the EU court remained silent and, and, and resorted to other um, avenues of, of interpretation. So, uh, um, could you please wrap up? Really yes, yes. Quickly? You uh, are three, already a three, few three, minutes over. Yeah, yeah, yes. Thank yes, you. I'm sorry. Uh, three uh, observations. It's a work in progress. Three observations that the, the EU court has been quite reluctant to undertake its own investigation into state practice opinion juris. Uh, and, and there was no general engagement with the interpretation. Uh, rather, it used certain avoidance techniques such as heavily relying on the AG's analysis uh, or, or, or uh, copy pasting the main findings or replacing the customary norm in question with, with a corresponding general principle of EU law or third, interpreting away vital issues of customary law by using the toolbox of treaty interpretation. And the possible reasons are manifold. The EU conceives itself as a domestic court, uh, second, uh, the EU court's uh, unease may be linked to the lack of resources and, and specialized knowledge in this, in this regard. Third, given that uh, uh, customary norms uh, have been created out of the EU legal order and the EU uh, couldn't play a role in that, then it, 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 there's certain mistrust uh, uh, against them. So my final uh, words are the following. Uh, the EU court's engagement with interpretation of customer international law, uh, unlike uh, the approach of the AGs, remains underdeveloped. So there's room for improvements, also from the perspective of EU uh, court's output legitimacy. Uh, so the EU court's application of CIL will only be procedurally fully legitimate if the accompanying interpretative reasoning is significantly improved. Thanks for your kind attention. Sorry for overstepping my time limit. Thank you, Thomas, for your presentation. Um, I think this has been very rich and interesting panel and uh, perhaps even giving some kind of comparative or comparable insight into how interpretation works in different contexts and how, what is the level of interpretative engagement and why is it so in different areas. Um, I think it was interesting what Neha pointed out. Uh, are we looking perhaps of some kind of harmonization through the interpretative exercises, or are we going into a completely different direction with different fields, different courts having their own silos of interpretative methods and outcomes? Also, I think we heard that there can is quite a lot of repackaging. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a good interpretative tool to put this old wine into a new bottle. Uh, but I think we can agree that there is a lot of contrasting elements uh, in all of these three courts uh, or three, three um, areas that we, we've been looking at today. Uh, I would suggest I'm gonna pose a couple of questions uh, to the panelists and then I will open the floor and I will also then read questions from the chat. So first of all, uh, Neha, I was wondering about the title of your presentation and the managerial aspect a little bit more in detail, because uh, I kind of, when I hear managerial approach, I'm thinking, you know, chase and chase and jumping into a little bit to the interactional uh, approach and so on. So um, do you link the managerial approach, how you see it somehow into this. And if you can say just a few words on that. And secondly, in different international courts and tribunals, do you see a difference in their interpretative exercises and the level of engagement? Um, uh, in outcomes, I think we have quite clear evidence that uh, it's not the same for all the international criminal courts and tribunals. I'm thinking, for example, you know, the third leg of the joint criminal enterprise, how that was interpreted in the ICTY, and then in a quite a different way in the ECCC. Um, 
So if you have come across these differences, um, and then Paula, I know not very much about in, uh, investment arbitration. So this was a in, very nice introduction through custom into, into that area. I was wondering about this causality between lower threshold of uh, attribution and the depolitization. Uh, is this more of a suggested hypothesis or is there some evidence on what is, is this goal reached and what does it mean? Um, is there effective depolitization and is that a good thing? And then a similar question as I posed to Neha on the differences. Are there different modes and methods of interpretation of custom between different arbitrations? And finally, um, Thomas, something you note in your paper, I'm not sure if you actually uh, addressed that on your presentation, but I wanted to ask you about, you note the, that EU court is engaging in authentic interpretation versus the, what international courts are doing. So if you could elaborate, I understand where you're coming from with this, but if you could elaborate a little bit more on how you see authentic and inauthentic interpretation in this context and more broadly. So I, I give the floor to Neha, thank you. Great, thank you, and, and, and great questions, both of them. So, so the way in which I use managerialism was not in the shade and shade sense, you know, and I think uh, Laurence, for instance, you know, in her EGO forward a couple of years back, also takes from shade and shade and how she talks about, you know, coordination between actors and the internal coherence of the system as, as signifying the managerial approach. Uh, mine borrows from the second strand of scholarship, which discusses managerialism, which is Marty Koskinemi and Jean d'Aspremont. Um, and so it's the critical strand of international legal scholarship on managerialism. Um, and, and the premise there is that global problems can be solved by experts resorting to um, specific knowledge um, and the instruments within their own spheres of expertise. Um, and so the idea is that the objectives of the institutional action are, are already a given. And then the only remaining question becomes about the manner of how do we optimize or realize those objectives. And so that was the managerial approach that, that I was invoking, that the objective of international criminal law or international criminal law institutions, impunity, like you know, preventing in violent crime, avoiding impunity, that has been taken as a given. And then custom is being used to optimize that objective um, through you know, knowledge, uh, the knowledge production and, and the experts who then applying the custom. So that was the sense in which I was using managerialism, which is a more critical sense. Um, and yes, there is absolutely a difference, and you're, you're very right, of course, even within the international criminal tribunals. That's, um, and so that's, so especially between the ICTY and the ECCC, you, you know, one can consider what factors might have motivated that difference, um, say on JCE3, um, you know, and then of course the STL, which comes later and then also disagrees on, you know, at, on JCE3. And so one, and this is, you know, again, referring back in some ways to Stephen's point about, you know, how we understand the content of custom can also change um, over time. And so one, there are the time element, the ICTY is first, and after that comes the ECCC, and after that comes the STL. Um, both the STL and the ECCC are civil law influenced tribunals, where the principle of legality might mean something different compared to a common law influenced tribunal like the ICTY and where it sees the judge um, and, and the importance of lex scripta as you know, the condition of the principle of legality. Um, the third is the audience question, which I think Serena brought up in the, in the last panel. Um, the ICTY at the point of time it's inventing JCE3 um, has nothing, you know, it's, you know, everyone's trying to make this court function uh, whereas the ECCC and the STL are working against a backdrop and the ICTY has been heavily criticized for coming up with JCE3. So there's, you know, there's issues of legal culture, there's issues of legal, you know, timing, and then there's issues of audience. I think all of which are influencing why there might be a split between the criminal tribunals themselves. So they're not a monolith for sure. Um, and so thank you for sort of drawing attention to that. Thank you so much. Um, I will move without further ado to Paula, please. Thanks as well for the questions, Nora. They're very good. So uh, I will start for the with the depolitization one. Yeah, I. It depends on what you, it, whether they achieved uh, 
depolitic to depoliticize international investment law and arbitration depends on the point of view that you're coming from right so if you're talking about simply taking states off the equation in dispute settlement that's definitely what they did so you do not have you don't you don't have diplomatic protection so uh, an investor that wants to take an, a dispute internationally doesn't need to search for straight for state approval or any type of sponsoring. So in this sense, they did achieve. But if you're talking about overall, I don't think that there is a system that is apolitical or de fully depoliticized. I think it's actually impossible. And the choice of depoliticize something is itself a political choice. And we can also see this, particularly in the idea of how uh, um, that I presented in my, uh, my presentation about how the uh, arbitrators themselves choose different options in terms of interpretation Article 8, just because they have a political view about state-owned enterprise. So I tend to think that the goal of depoliticize, um, it depends on what you consider. There is this idea that uh, taking the state out of the equation will make something neutral and less politicized. I don't see it necessarily that way. I see um, politics as deep ideological choices. And I think it's difficult for you to actually say that this was achieved. But if you're talking just about taking the state out of the equation, they kind of did that in many ways. And it has been achieved in terms of facilitating access to international dispute settlement mechanisms without the help of a state interfering in the whole process. So it depends a bit on the, on the point of view that you're coming from. On the, in terms of roles and methods of interpretation for each tribunal, I think that there is a, 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 the response will be very similar to Neha's, although it's a completely different kind of context. Um, we are talking about arbitration and not a static tribunal. And although you do have common rules and uh, common standards that are followed, each um, case is, is dealt with upon completely different sets of rules. There is no obligation for them to for the for them to be attached to pre, to precedent or anything like that. So, and not only that, arbitrators profiles are very different. So you have both very commercial, very private oriented arbitrators and public international law ones. So they do see the cases from completely different standpoints, and it's I would say almost impossible for you to uniformize or generalize about anything when it comes to investment law and arbitration which makes work uh, very, very difficult when you're working with these cases, but at the same time, very interesting because it shows how different uh, worldviews, uh, methods and ideas can come to play and affect outcomes. Uh, but it's actually one of, the main, one of the main criticism that you see today because they follow such different methods and such different approaches uh, each in each case, you don't have a consistent case law. It becomes very unpredictable and there are even some movements towards trying to establish a common court and a single court that might uniformize that. But this won't be possible if you're applying different treaties and different rules, regardless of whether you have a single court or not. But it might, as, but it might help in terms of approaching cases, how to read them and methods. Thank you. That is very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, and Thomas. Thanks, Norma, for this uh, a question. So the EU courts and authentic interpretation of, of, of the law. I mean, starting from the textbook example, so the EU court uh, uh, is, is meant to uh, uh, provide for the authentic interpretation of EU law. So this is uh, uh, what, what, what the main uh, role of the Luxembourg courts. Uh, and if we take EU law uh, in its uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, reality, it also includes customary international uh, uh, rules, which are part and parcel, which have been recognized. So we can advance the argument. So if the EU is full, authentic interpret EU law, that should apply to each and every kind of rule, no matter the source. Hence, and there should be more bravery from the EU court to live up to this responsibility, also uh, in its dealings with, with norms of customary origin, not just regulations, directives, you know, the, the usual suspects. But I, I can see so far, based on this still, uh, it's a work in progress, my preliminary research, that uh, 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 the, the, the EU courts have the reliance uh, on the ICJ and its uh, uh, rulings, uh, just to identify customer law and then stop there uh, is is explained by by its unease to uh, 
really uh, uh, you know uh, uh, serve as 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 a, as a court uh, interpreting um, customary norms with full blast and. The EU court sees the ICJ as, as the word court and de facto the most uh, qualified uh, interpreter of customer international uh, rules. So there's a certain certain uh, uh, deference uh, towards the ICJ. Okay, uh, whatever you have said, I take it for granted. I don't want to enter into conflict since we are just the regional court and you are the, the uh, uh, word court. Um, but... Um, it's it's as I concluded. It's a question to what extent it can undermine the uh, output legitimacy of the of the EU court uh, uh, and and also uh, there's an ex the the EU treaty making activities are uh, are expanding and also the EU's uh, uh, profile as a major global actor uh, is is on the rise. So more and more international related cases. Uh, will uh, uh, end up in the EU court's uh, uh, docket. So it would be more desirable uh, that, okay, the, the CJEU uh, leaps up to this, you know, to this challenge uh, uh, and, and uh, establishes uh, more confidence and greater authority uh, in its dealings with, with customary uh, international law. Thank you. Highly interesting how how uh, there could be this kind of approach that the European court actually considers itself as the authentic interpreter of customer international law, even if it doesn't do so in practice. Yeah, and just, just one, one final remark without abusing me at the time. Uh, when it comes to interpreting treaty rules uh, and other norms of international, so written rules, I can't see this kind of sad restriction. So the EU court uh, uh, engages in even progressive interpretation, interpretation or sometimes conflicting interpretation and uh, international lawyers criticize, oh, what the judges in Luxembourg did again. Uh, so uh, it's also interesting that for some sources, no uh, uh, constraints, and, uh, but for unwritten sources, it's a more self-restricted approach. Thank you. I will open the floor to questions, and I would also uh, note that the panelists are welcome to ask questions from one another if they so wish. Um, and yes, I really would invite the audience to perk up and ask your final customer international law interpretation questions of the day. Your Highness Judge, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you very much. I just want to make an observation rather than a question to Ms. Paula Battini's you know, intervention on how context shifts the interpretation of the general international customary rules. Uh, I believe that you know, uh, she made a very good presentation and mentioned the standard of the control uh, in a certain way. Uh, in the jurisprudence of the ICTY, we also have the same you know, situations. Uh, as we know that in the Nijalagua case, you know, the ICJ made a standard of the effective control to qualify it, what is the international armed conflict, you know, uh, uh, so that to address the responsibilities of the state. Uh, but when we use the, the, uh, the when we applied it in our jurisprudence, we found that that standard is too high so we created a kind of overall control, you know, uh, 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 standard. So is that a conflict to each other? Is that the fragmentation of the uh, international, you know, law in this aspect? Uh, we don't think so because you know uh, the ICTY used uh, so-called uh, uh, teleological interpretations of this. Uh, rules to solve a problem. Uh, and the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, ICJ, its main function is to address the uh, responsibility of the state. While for, for, for the ICTY, the purpose and the aims is to address the individual criminal responsibility. Uh, whether it's an international armed conflict, uh, it's just a contextual element in which we could address the uh, the, uh, the 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 individual criminal responsibility. So standard is 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 much lower, much lower 
than the uh, effective control, you know, uh, uh, standard. So that shows that it shows that you know, uh, from the different contexts and the different purpose, you know, we may have the different interpretations of the same, you know, uh, rules uh, on that. So uh, on that part, I completely agree uh, with Paula's intervention in this aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, Paula, would you like to respond immediately? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for the comment. Yes, actually, I didn't mention overall control because I was because uh, because the case the case law that I uh, that I got referred to mostly the ICJ, but I'm completely familiar with the overall control. And I'm remembering uh, actually that in the genocide case where when they when they ha had to discuss about the overall control standard put down by the ICTY, there was um, there was a separate opinion, and I'm not sure which judge said it, wrote it, but they, met, but they mentioned specifically that they don't see the two standards as conflicting because they, meant, they are meant for different things. I think that my main uh, point in relation specifically to the, to the investment state arbitration is that because of the way that it's pulverized and designed, the approach is not unified within the system. So it's a bit unpredictable and you don't know what to expect out of the case in the end. So whereas in the ICJ, you know what to expect. In the ICTY, you knew what you, what you could expect. Whereas in the in ISDS, it will depend on the arbitrator that you get and how they see the specific law in that context. Although there seems to be that in relation to state-owned enterprise specifically, they tend to be a bit more inclined because you have more cases that end up applying a very corporate-like approach. So, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I would now suggest we collect at least three questions and then go back to the panelists. So we would have first Panos and then Neha followed by Stephen. Panos, go ahead. Thank you, Nora. Um, just a disclaimer because I have three questions. Um, if, if, <laughs> if that's a problem, I can, uh, because I've been asking a lot of questions, I can be the last one if there is time. Why don't we do it like that in okay. that case? So Neha, go ahead. Uh, my question was actually to Thomas because the question is, um, it, it's not really a rhetorical question, even though it might sound like it, um, is when is assertion just assertion? And I say that because of the distinction you draw, drew between how the court reasons and how the attorney general reasons. But the court reasons the way it does in every case, which is to say it has this highly cryptic Cartesian reasoning um, for the most part, where it does a shorthand axiomatic uh, you know, conclusions from which are very badly explained uh, and which for a common law lawyer are actually almost impossible to read. So, so this doesn't seem to be an anomaly um, in terms of you know, how the attorney general's opinion then needs to be played against the reasoning of the court as such. And whereas, um, so that kind of assertion I would expect when it comes to the CGEU, when it looks at custom or anything else for that matter, uh, whereas it's not the assertion that, that I was speaking about in the International Criminal Tribunals is very rare because you have judgments running into a thousand pages where everything but the kitchen sink is thrown in, uh, you know, for everything. So it's assertion in both cases, um, but it's assertion in the context of a tribunal which regularly reasons in this fashion versus assertion in the context of a tribunal for whom it's a total departure to reason in this fashion. So it's the same technique, but uh, but in very different institutional contexts and reasoning styles of different bodies. So I was just wondering if you could reflect on how you see assertion um, and whether it's you know it's a uniform con concept or methodology across tribunals. Excellent question, thank you. And uh, Stephen. Yes. Yeah, so my my question is all about also about uh, reasoning, and it's for for Neha. And I wondered if she might reflect on my reflection on her paper. So we've we've heard a lot today about uh, deductive reasoning. And I think in the context of customer international law, you can see an argument that goes, the state is sovereign, and that's for some rules logically follow from the, the nature of the, the primary unit of international law. And so in the Nicaragua case, non-intervention is both evidenced by Pino Euros and state practice, but is also um assumed to be a, a logical deduct is deduced from the nature of sovereignty 
But now yeah, your argument seemed to be more pro harmony, humanitarian, almost like we can deduce from the nature of the international community, the values of the international community. And so there seemed to be a bit of deductive reasoning going on there. Now, in the context of what is the sovereign state, that is contested, but that's fairly narrowly contested. But when we're talking about what is the nature of the international community and from what can we deduce from that, that definitely seems to be in the eye of the beholder. I just wondered if that was part of your thinking, but it's definitely given me something to think about in terms of the, the way we, we can deduce rules of customary or norms of customary international law, not only from sovereignty, but also from the international community. Thank you, Stephen. And we have one question on the chat, which I will read out. And this is from Karem Luisa Gardenas in Funches to Paula. Uh, it's true that in investment law, case law precedents are less constraining upon arbitrators, but have you come across if that also is true for those arbitrators that are recurrently appointed as such? Um, I would suggest we do a fairly quick round of uh, responses by the panelists, and then we take uh, Panos and any further questions that come from the audience. So uh, let's continue in the same order as before. Nea, floor is yours. Thank you. So I think I think that's a really interesting um, interesting reflection on you know and sort of the continuities between your your paper and mine in some ways. And it's true that so so the level at which um, the conceptual foundation goes is much much deeper, and then they're going into the very structure of the international community, how we derive values from there. And those values can be anything like dictates of humanity and public conscience are everything and nothing. Um, but then on the other end, the rules that are being derived are also much narrower. It's saying what are the elements of a crime such as rape based upon this foundational value, which is supposedly dictates of public conscience. And so it's the, the spectrum, I would say, is more extreme on both ends, that you're deriving the source from which you're deriving is much more abstract. And the rule that you're deriving from that source is also much more narrow and highly specific, which is about specific criminal law elements, which is very, very legislative in a way, in a way that it may not be for general public international law, where, where the rule is still framed at a, at a fairly high level of abstraction. So, um, so thank you for pointing it out that the spectrum on both ends, the derivation spectrum or the deduction spectrum is, um, is much, much, much broader in terms of the source being more abstract, and then the rule itself then being much more rule-like, if you will, um, rather than at the level of a principle. Thank you. Paula. Oh, thank you, uh, Karen. Um, yes, they are less, I think, I think that there's a difference between uh, when we're talking about constraining in terms of whether they are legally binding and whether um, they can be constrained by, by logic, by consistency, or by choice. I think that if binding, they, they are generally not binding. Precedent is not binding. And it couldn't be binding because you do not have the consistency or the stability of a legal system that would be required for you to, for you to require a binding, a binding precedent in terms of system. Uh, so any kind of consistency that you end up seeing and any reference to previous case law, they come, they come, as, they come as subsidiary forms of, of identifying the law. And of course, that you, if you have similar arbitrators, they will tend to refer to the same principles because they have already a similar view of the law and they will refer to the same, to the same, to the same basis that they tend to. But, they're not, but the, even in that case, they're not compelled to. I have not looked, looked specifically if repeated appointments, if they judge always on the same standards. I find that this cases under some similar circumstances related to the same treaties, they tend to have a relatively consistent, um, consistent outcome. So if you take a look at the Argentina cases, once you had one finding, other cases would be more or less following similar lines, even if they are not binding upon each other because we, since you're dealing with the same norms, similar circumstances, they will re result in similar outcomes. There's no reason why other tribunals wouldn't refer to previous cases if someone already did the work for them. But it's not binding on its own. It's more of a consistency issue. 
But this will, of course, vary depending on how arbitrators themselves see consistency and how they see each case and their duty to follow that. Thank you. And Thomas. Thanks, Neha, for this very intriguing and thought-provoking question. So whether assertion uh, is different from uh, uh, assertion, it, 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 depending on the judicial body uh, uh, and, and the, um, how to say, uh, the context. Uh, uh, I don't know whether I can, I can answer uh, that question in sufficient, how to say, detail, just some, some reflections and considerations. Uh, uh, I think the, the, the one element of difference uh, is that uh, like international criminal courts, other courts uh, that we have talked about, uh, operates mainly in the international legal order. And the EU court is uh, um, technically and traditionally or historically, it's also an international court, but uh, it has become something quite different. And, and uh, this is the highest judicial instance of, of a sui generis and specific legal order, which uh, claims autonomy from from international law, so at least uh, the it's it's the, the point of departure is is a bit uh, uh, different, and um, yeah, one might argue that uh, it's the uh, natural state of affairs if the EU court simply asserts uh, uh, customer international rules. Uh, uh, taking them for granted, relying on like ICJ and other sources without any kind of engagement. Um, and if we look at the, let's say, uh, uh, nature of the, of the reasoning, yes, the EU court uses this uh, French style of really short, succinct uh, 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 way of argumentation when the written text, written judgment is just the tip of the iceberg of, of all the thinking behind uh, by the judges. But lately or over time, uh, uh, even EU court rulings uh, have become uh, longer and, and more, more detailed, especially uh, grand chamber uh, uh, ruling. So uh, I think uh, that, that has changed a bit and, and, and the way uh, the EU court reasons and argues uh, has become more sophisticated in which I think a more sophisticated nuanced uh, engagement with customer international law would also uh, uh, find a place. And when it comes to interpreting uh, international treaties to which the EU is party, uh, it's not merely uh, just uh, asserting uh, whatever other international treaty interpreting uh, bodies uh, have found, but there's more, as far as I can see, uh, uh, more confidence and, and, and more detailed engagement. Uh, so I, I, I would see a clear uh, um, room and and uh, need for uh, uh, for that. So in in light of recent developments um, and also the, the EU legal order is getting more and more internationalized in a way. Um, perhaps uh, 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 there's no big differences between the types of of uh, assertion by by different judicial bodies. Thank you, Thomas. So we ha I'm closing the floor for questions. We have Eleni and then Panos, and then we'll have a final round. If somebody has a very, very urgent question, please type it in and we'll see if there is time. I have about 30 minutes maximum until I have to check out. So Eleni, please. Very short, just to... Um, continuing the line of uh, reasoning from Stephen, um, just a comment for Thomas and the question uh, at the same time. Uh, do you think that this reluctance of the ECJ um, to follow, uh, CL, to adopt CL uh, interpretation is a kind of, is a cultural issue, meaning that uh, they consider themselves as an autonomous legal order within their own borders. And that perhaps uh, um, runs the risk um, to become uh, a self-referential system. And uh, if I may go on, uh, become an isolated one. And um, well, this is my 
my thoughts. Uh, and uh, just a comment for what we're discussing, Paul, about overall and uh, effective control. I think it was on the genocide case, uh, Professor Higgins, um, who spoke about uh, the two uh, types of control and then differentiated between, and okay, stopped all this discussion and debate about which square and um, concluded it, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Eleni. And Panos, thank you for your patience. Now I give the floor to you. No, 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 no. I get more material the more I wait. So it was not out of my ki the kindness of my heart. <laughs> um, so thank you all. Uh, thank you to, to all the, uh, the panelists for these really interesting uh, presentations. Um, my questions are one, one for each uh, uh, speaker. So uh, Neha, um, I want to ask you, um, so the, the managerialism angle, the managerial approach, um, do you think that uh, I understand it within the context of a particular field, the area of law, uh, that you have certain objectives and uh, you, uh, you try and address these? Um, my question would be, given the cross fertilization that sometimes happen between courts and tribunals, do you see the, the potential of, you know, because of the gravitas of one court, let's say the, the ICJ, that a rule that from a managerial perspective was adopted and had a particular content, then it is kind of transposed into an area where if you apply the managerial approach, it shouldn't have that. And do you see if there is a problem with that or if there are any safeguards that, that, that you know, would counteract that? Um, to Paula, uh, Article 8, always a fantastic uh, topic. Uh, so uh, my question would be, Given the fact that um, even the intercells uh, or by international courts and tribunals could, well, according to the ILC, they're not state practice. You may agree or disagree with, with that, but at least they're supplementary means. So could you, is it, is it a potential scenario in the future that through these, let's say if there are consecutive, and I take the point that in investment law, it's a little bit problematic, um, but let's say, they find a particular way and they go that way, that you might end up with, um, you know, very specialized rules of attribution. So depending on a particular area of law, you end up with, with different secondary customary rules. At the moment, they are simply an interpretation of Article 8, but could that potentially lead to specialized secondary uh, rules? Um, and uh, Tomas, um, every, every time there's a discussion about the Court of Justice of the Europe, Union and all the public international lawyers, you know, go on a rant about the, the, the Court of Justice. Uh, I'm afraid that's that's the case also uh, with me. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you, um, because I was very interested in the uh, Opel uh, Austria case, right, uh, where you said that they took a customary international law rule from the, the not to defeat the object and purpose, if I remember correctly, and then they kind of repackaged it as a principle of EU law. Correct? So my question there is, um, what happens then, is, if, if there is any discussion on that, do, does the Court of Justice and generally EU lawyers see that as remaining connected to the customary rule? So is, if there are changes to the customary rule, would these automatically be reflected uh, to you know, the, uh, the EU principle? Or does it, again, have uh, an autonomous being in and of itself, and then it becomes an autonomous entity? But thank you again for, for all your presentations. There we go. Okay, thank you, Panos. And uh, as before, we proceed in the same order. So now you go first. Thank you. That's a great question. I think uh, so. so the, the question has several layers, and I'm going to, and I'm not going to be able to do justice to all of them. Uh, you know, one of the layers is simply the cross fertilization between tribunals as such, like without necessarily considering the status of a particular tribunal or the prestige of a particular tribunal, etc. Um, and so there, I see, especially between the international criminal tribunals and the international human rights tribunals, 
there is quite a lot of um, tension in that sense already um, with, uh, you know, as in the international human rights courts, the regional human rights bodies are at the forefront of developing some international criminal law rules now. Um, and then, you know, and then the, the general um, criticism tends to be that, well, you know, they don't really understand the law of genocide and why specific intent is so important, you know, and they include all kinds of groups that are not stable uh, and permanent, for instance, um, like the European Court of Human Rights that included political groups uh, of, of a type in, in the definition of the protected group um, under genocide, for example. So, so there is there is the sense that if a different tribunal um, in borrowing a rule then doesn't take into account the, the context in which that rule came about and within the treaty architecture within which that customary international rule could flourish actually, um, then it's actually do you know it's a it's a case of transplantation that um, that is not that is not legitimate in some ways or that's not accurate because the transplantation um, and this reminds me of you know um, in in a different context for comparative lawyers um, Gunter Frankenberg's theory of legal transplants where he likens them to IKEAs you know so so if you have you know an IKEA table you know an IKEA table is an IKEA table in Switzerland and it's an IKEA table in Nigeria. Um, and so there's something very distinct about, you know, your standard IKEA table, uh, but then it's, you know, it's repurposed. So you have an IKEA table, it's meant, you know, it goes to the central IKEA, you know, <laughs> whatever have you, central body, which decides this is what the perfect platonic IKEA table looks like. And then, you know, and then it's repurposed into the context of Nigeria. Uh, and maybe there'll be a little, you know, maybe it'll be rosewood instead of oak. Maybe it'll be you know less light brown uh, compared to the one in Sweden, but it's identifiably an IKEA table, um, and so so there's a mode of transplantation that works, you know, which is the Gunter Frankenberg IKEA version, and the mode of transplantation that doesn't work, uh, where the adaptation is not to the local context, where the transplanted rule simply serves as an irritant, which never quite manages to adapt to the local context. And I think that's where the worry is about, you know, this managerial approach uh, where, and cross fertilization than having one sort of managerialism clash with whatever the managerial approach would be for another, for another tribunal. And then just to finish up, like, and then in the context of ICTs, this is particularly acute, the problem, um, because now there seems to be a general turn towards criminal law and criminalization as one way to deal with all kinds of serious violations. You know, we see that for, things such as disability rights now even you know with a new article coming out that anything that human rights courts are handling is just not serious enough like no matter what they're saying in terms of the messaging and so it should be given to international criminal tribunals with punitive criminal sanctions and the worry is that you know so a customary international law rule which was developed in the concept of human rights law to deal with these very severe human rights violations then comes to the international criminal tribunals uh, with all sorts of un, unintended consequences, so to speak, uh, because the managerialism of criminal tribunals and, and the logic of criminal law is quite different from the logic of human rights law, um, simpliciter. So, so I think it's a really interesting question about what happens when you have clashes in managerial approaches um, and then this transfer between courts. Thank you. And now to Paula, please. Thanks, Panos, for the very interesting question. I think it's very hard to predict the future when it comes to law in general, especially in the field that is in crisis the way that, that, that investment law is. There's a lot of discussions going on, so it's difficult to really predict. But I, I tend to think that if at least the intentions of the tribunals that decided in this way the, 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 in relation to state-owned enterprises seem to be to create a special rule on attribution when it comes to those entities. So if you take a look at the judgments themselves, they seem to be perfectly aware that there are other possibilities of interpretation of rules of attribution. They mention it and they say that they are choosing a different one. So I think that uh, something that, that what makes very very interesting is that which one will prevail. If you see the, ca the cases that we see in the first one, they come at the same time as the discussions in the, in the IOC are happening for the, for the RCRA. And then, you have a gap of around 10 years and then you see those discussions coming back again. So I tend to, I think that at least the tribunals that are, that want this to have, that are making those decisions in terms of a more corporate approach when it comes to state-owned enterprises and control over them, 
they are in, they are interested in creating a specialized rule for that, and they they are very clearly uh, mentioning these this in the in the judgments, which I think it's what it's most interesting about it. Whether they will prevail or not, I think it depends also if those arbitrators are chosen and chosen again. If you have if you have a different case on this uh, related to a similar issue, right? Because it's the parties in the end who choose them. So if the system wants it, if the stakeholders wants it, this is what will prevail. We will have specialized rules. Thank you. And finally, um, Thomas, please. Thanks, Nora. Thanks for the questions. First, um, Alan, whether the concept of autonomy of EU law uh, is a possible explanation or reason uh, uh, behind the, the EU court's more guarded approach uh, when it comes to engaging in customer international law. Yes, I, I can see it uh, definitely that, uh, I mean, uh, this, this can also be perceived as, as a uh, emanation or, or uh, another form of this uh, EU court as a domestic court and uh, 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 judges uh, can use the argument of the autonomy of EU law to not just squeezing out norms of external origin, but also to, to limit the, 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 the way they engage uh, with the interpretation of, of uh, CIL. Um, and uh, uh, the Opel Austria case, which will be uh, also subject to the, the second uh, uh, question, uh, the, the way I see that there was uh, uh, a norm invoked by the, the parties, so the court couldn't, uh, uh, how to say, uh, set it aside, it, it had to uh, deal with that, the, the interim obligation, but given that there was a corresponding uh, concept in EU law, then uh, that was easier and that was more uh, comfortable for the court to use, and yeah, as I argued, this is, this is a way to assert the autonomy of, of, of EU law as well, or right, to invoke something which comes from international law, but I have a corresponding uh, other concept, I would rather use that. And uh, uh, it, it also uh, uh, protects the, the uniformity and, and the, uh, let's say, uh, self-sufficient uh, character uh, of my, of my uh, legal order. So definitely, I think this, this plays a role. And then uh, Panos' question regarding uh, this kind of, uh, uh, two-way process between a, a, a customer norm and, and the, whether once it's transformed, so to speak, into uh, a general principle of EU law, uh, if the, if I understand correctly, if for instance, the uh, uh, customer norm changes, whether it, it changes also the meaning and context of the corresponding uh, general principle of EU law. And now I was pondering, maybe the term I used transforming the customary rule of this interim obligation into another uh, general principle of EU law, uh, it's a bit uh, too, too much. It was perhaps not the right word. I would rather say that the court mirrored uh, the CIL norm uh, to uh, an already existing uh, EU law uh, uh, principle. So it's it's not transforming maybe I was too much from my side, but just uh, looking for uh, a corresponding uh, norm that can be used with the exclusion of the invoked uh, uh, customary uh, norm. Hence, uh, based on that, I, I am not aware of, of, of any such, uh, let's say, uh, the, the back effect that, that uh, uh, if the customer norm changes, then to, to what extent uh, the corresponding uh, general principle of law uh, has also uh, uh, changed its, its, its content. Uh, but what I can think uh, as, as a possible uh, example for that uh, is when the same norm exists both in international law and, and uh, EU law, for instance, good faith. And in this regard, yeah, interim obligation is just the more specific emanation of good faith. But we can say that interim obligation is also a substanding, more specific rule. But if we zoom out and just talk about good faith, uh, that that can be, I think, uh, uh, let's say, a possible scenario that in other areas where the principle of good faith or the yeah customer normal good faith. Uh, uh, is invoked uh, or comes into play in the EU legal order. Uh, and if the EU says, okay, I'm not applying the internet, this CIA rule of good faith, but the EU law principle of good faith, then I think this kind of cross-fertilization of, of more uh, uh, direct connection 
uh, can be can be established. And uh, but this is all theoretical, since I'm not aware of, of any uh, case law where uh, this was the 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 topic. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the panelists and participants for great questions and great answers. I think this has been uh, very, very interesting. We, I think we've covered today, and especially in this panel, a lot of new ground, at least for me. And I think it's uh, fair to say that the study of customer international, as well as customer international law and its interpretation are anything but static. Uh, it seems to me that there are so many new approaches that have, have uh, come about since, uh, since the last time I was completely immersed in the study of custom. Um, so I want to thank you again, the organizers and the panelists and the audience. And I think Panos, you probably will have the last word. I'm really finding it um, unfortunate we don't get to get, go together to the conference dinner. I was looking forward to that, but hopefully sometime soon. So Panos, thank you. Thank you very much, Nora, and uh, thank you to all the uh, the panelists uh, for their wonderful uh, presentations. Um, I'll, I'll say a few words, and then I'll, I'll leave the floor in case anybody uh, else wants to uh, to add from the uh, my esteemed co-organizers. Um, it's uh, again simply to to thank all of you. Indeed, Nora, uh, this would be the time that if it was a live conference, uh, we would go on uh, for uh, dinner, and where I could continue my lifelong experiment to see whether indeed in vino veritas, but unfortunately there is a gap in my research there uh, nowadays. Um, uh, again, it's been a long day. We thank you all very much uh, for your time and, and, and patience uh, here. I won't wrap up today. We'll wrap it up all tomorrow because I understand everybody's uh, very tired. We've gone longer, but this is because of how interesting all the presentations uh, were. Um, so unless um, my co-organizers have anything to add, and I don't see anybody turning on their screen. Uh, so thank you all very much again on behalf of Tricky Law, Pluri Courts, and the TLS. Thank you very, very much, uh, everybody. And we'll see you tomorrow at nine o'clock for the remaining two panels on controversies in uh, customary international law interpretation in uh, international courts and the final panel on interpretation and coherence. So once again, thank you very much uh, for uh, making this a very, very thought provoking and stimulating uh, first day of our conference and we'll see you tomorrow.